Matthew chapter 21, verse 28. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, My son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I don't want to. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the man went to the other and said the same thing. I will, sir, he answered, but he didn't go. Which of the two did his father's will? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. But you, when you saw it, didn't even change your minds then and believe him. Listen to another parable. There was a land, <coughs> excuse me, there was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. He leased it to tenant farmers and went away. When the time came to harvest fruit, he sent his servants to the farmers to collect his fruit. The farmers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first group, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? He will completely destroy those terrible men, they told him, and lease his vineyard to other farmers who will give him his fruit at the harvest. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is what the Lord has done, and it is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will shatter him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew he was speaking about them. Although they were looking for a way to arrest him, they feared the crowds because the people regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's important to set the background uh, to get the context for this passage of Jesus' teaching. Uh, our passage today follows straight on from last week's Uh, So he's still speaking to the chief priests and the elders of the people. Uh, Remember, these are the insiders. And it's the day after his kingly entry into Jerusalem. Of course, there are others, the disciples and other followers uh, around him, but his message is for the elders, for the leaders of Israel. And this is the last week of his life, just days before Jesus would be betrayed, arrested, tried and crucified. So in many ways, these conversations with the leaders of the people are Jesus' last-ditch efforts to reach them before the end of his earthly ministry. Just prior to this, the leaders and Jesus had the exchange that we saw last week. Jesus had his authority questioned. But rather than answering, he put it back on them to answer it. They weren't dependent on God. So they couldn't bring themselves to recognise that both John and Jesus had been sent from God. And they also feared the crowd, so they said, we don't know. And Jesus' simple reply was, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Their hearts were hard. They were set in their ways, and they wouldn't listen to what God was saying or even had already said through the Old Testament promises of the coming Messiah. So Jesus tells them two parables about vineyards to show them their error. But both these parables have a lot to say about authority 
and obedience, about insiders who didn't obey and outsiders who repented and were brought in. Uh, The other thing that you need to know is vines and vineyards in the Old Testament were code for the Israelite nation. Uh, We saw that in our Isaiah reading, but also in, in Psalm 80, God is described as digging up the vine out of Egypt and transplanting it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shade. Uh, At first, they are fruitful, luxuriant vines, Hosea tells us, Uh, but in most references, they end in judgment, like our Isaiah reading. Okay, point two on the outline, in the first parable, which is not really a parable about a vineyard, but it's set in a vineyard, and the first son is clearly a stand-in for the tax collectors and prostitutes, those reviled outsiders that Jesus refers to later in the parable. That son said he would not do the work that the father asked him to do, uh, which might seem shocking to us. But it was much worse at the time because it broke the fifth commandment to honour your father and mother. But later he changed his mind and went to work. The tax collectors and prostitutes, or really any repentant sinner like me or you, are people who at one point had looked at the sin in their lives and said, I like this, I don't need to change, I'm independent, I don't need anyone telling me what to do. But then later, hearing the call of God to come to repentance, they've said, he's right, I can't keep doing this, I'm totally dependent on God for everything, things have to change. The best thing about that is that for the repentant sinner, there is always forgiveness. Jesus lived and died to pay for that sin, even formally cherished and held on to sin. The sinner that says, I want to be done with this, God have mercy on me, already has that mercy from God through Jesus. But then what about the second son? He was a good bloke, wasn't he? He made a good show and paid lip service to the requests that the father made, but then did nothing he was asked to do. Jesus clearly has the religious leaders in his sights in this part of the parable. These men were talking the talk, wanting always to look good, to be seen on the street corners, but they weren't actually doing anything that God had asked them to do. Jesus will have strong words for them later in the week when he condemns these actions and attitudes. He will say to them, you are like whitewashed tombs that appear beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead people's bones and every kind of uncleanness. In the same way, on the outside you seem righteous to the people, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. But God had done so much to win them. He sent John the Baptist calling them to repent and they didn't believe him. Here again Jesus is addressing them directly as he often did, but still their hearts are hard. They are independent. They don't want to listen to what God said through John, through Jesus, through the Old Testament scriptures because they want to believe the lies that they have in their hearts that they are already good enough for God. They want to cling to the delusion that they didn't have sin that needed to be dealt with, or at least not like those sinners. That by comparison, they're pretty good. They're okay with God. Well, it's tempting for us, as we saw with the kids, to want to identify with the tax collectors and prostitutes here, isn't it? As shocking as that might seem. After all, they're the good guys in Jesus' parable, aren't they? It's tempting to want to compare ourselves with the first son in the parable. But really neither son is ideal, are they? Both did the wrong thing in Jesus' parable. One didn't obey the initial call of the father and the other opted to not follow through on the promise that he'd made. We don't really want to be either of them, do we? And yet so often we fail in both places. Where does sin have a little nook, a little hidey hole in your heart? Where is there something that God has said is wrong 
that you've decided you want to keep tucked away in there? What are the good things that God has told you to do and you've decided, nah, I'd rather not? What are your priorities in life? Are sports and entertainment or politics and news, work and family serving as your God? Taking that number one spot in your heart. Are there shameful things in your heart and even actions that perhaps nobody knows about but that you have no desire to change? Greed, selfishness, do you enjoy harbouring grudges and animosity against others? Where in your life are you an unrepentant tax collector or prostitute? Or perhaps you examine your heart and you find none of those things. Remember the rich young ruler? I've kept all those since I was a young man. Do you judge yourself to be perfectly in compliance with what God says without any self-awareness of where sin affects your thoughts, your attitudes, your motivations for your words and actions? Where are you an in-denial Pharisee? Figuring your life and your work should really be good enough for God. Well, just like for the chief priests and elders, it's not pleasant when God addresses our sin directly, is it? As we look into the mirror of God's word, we see our sin in all its horrid vividness. We aren't the perfect people that we want to think we are or we want others to think we are. Nor are we able to look at sin as a, a cute little pet that we want to keep with us and carry around. In the mirror of God's word, we see our sinful lives in their wretched glory. Our hearts by nature are stained and vile with sin. There is nothing commendable in us, and there is nothing that our sinful nature produces that is worth keeping around. And this, of course, is where God changes our minds, like that first son. He changes our hearts and actions. He leads us to repentance, which says, no, I don't want to think of myself as good enough. I don't want to think of that sin as okay or good because it's absolutely not. The mirror of God's law shows all of that to us and our need for a saviour. And there is Jesus, the one sent to rescue us from all of that terrible sin. Well, I'm at point three now and Jesus makes a stunning statement, doesn't he? Truly I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. It's a clear difference that Jesus points out between these leaders and the so-called sinners that they despise to round them. You have the chief priests and the Pharisees, maybe perhaps they should be up here, who spent their full time studying the laws, the commands of God. They were meticulous in their study of the commands of God through Moses. They knew how many letters were in the five books of Moses. They knew which one was the middle letter. They were the most sanctimonious and outwardly religious men in Jewish society. They were the insiders and they didn't need to repent. Then you have the tax collectors and the prostitutes, the most despicable two categories of people in Jewish society. In everyone's view, but especially the chief priests and Pharisees, if the tax collectors were the worst of men, then prostitutes were the worst of women. They may have been Israelites, but they were firmly on the outside but they are the ones listening to God through John, listening to Jesus. They are confessing their sins. They are repenting. God is working faith in them to trust in him for their forgiveness. So Jesus pronounces judgment and says that these most despicable sinners, tax collectors and prostitutes, are actually entering the kingdom of God ahead of the chief priests and the elders. Is it any wonder they wanted to kill him? But he's right, isn't he? And it's the same today because God doesn't look at the outward appearance. But as we learn from David in Psalm 51, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. It doesn't matter if we see ourselves as the worst of sinners or pretty good people who don't need to change. Everyone needs to repent of our independence 
of our rebellion against the father, the vineyard owner. Only one son in all history has perfectly said yes. Yes to God and perfectly backed it up with obedience. And that's Jesus. Jesus said yes to his heavenly father in leaving heaven and coming to earth. Jesus said yes to his heavenly father every day of his life by obeying the law of Moses. Every one of its restrictions, every one of its commands and prohibitions, Jesus perfectly obeyed all of them. He said yes every day of his life. And then in Gethsemane when God offered him hell and death in a cup, metaphorically to drink, he said yes and took the cup and drank it and on the cross he ultimately said yes to God. Uh, Well, we're at point four, and in the second parable, which is about a vineyard, we learn of a landowner who has planted a vineyard, leased it to tenants, and gone to another country. Uh, Like the vineyard owner in Isaiah 5 that Pat read for us, uh, he's taking great care in setting up this vineyard. It says, The one I love had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He broke up the soil, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the finest vines. He built a tower in the middle of it and even dug out a wine press there. He was expecting a good return of fine wine. And in Jesus' parable, he built a fence around it as well to keep out wild animals and perhaps errant teenagers, or perhaps that's just my errant teenagers. <coughs> in Jesus' time, it would often be five years before the landowner would expect to receive his first payment. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you are one of those tenants and that for the last five years you've worked hard in this vineyard and it's now really starting to produce a lot of fruit. About year three you might have made a small return as the as the vine started to produce. The fourth year you, you've made a, um, a pretty good return. The fifth year it's looking like a bumper harvest. And now, after five years without a word from the landowner, there suddenly appears some of his servants to collect the landowner's share of production, which you'd agreed to. You might have begun to think and to hope that these servants would never appear, that the landowner forgot all about this vineyard, that you would get to keep it all for yourself. After all, it's been five long years. Now, I'm not excusing the action of those tenants, but I do want you to see that it's not a great stretch to think that these tenants really began to believe that they owned the vineyard. They didn't need the owner. They were independent of him. Wouldn't that always be a danger for stewards when they hadn't seen the owner in a long while? Isn't that a danger for us? I'm at point five because you've heard what happened next in the parable. Of the servants who came for the produce, the tenants of the vineyard beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Well, the landowner is very patient, very merciful, very forgiving, but very persistent. He sends more servants. It seems there were three the first time and and many more the second time. And the tenants, in verse 36 did the same to them. They killed them. The owner treats these tenants with reckless generosity because last of all the landowner sends his own son. The landowner is hoping that the tenants will finally get the point that he hasn't forgotten about this vineyard. And the fruit is important enough to him that he's going to send his own son to collect it. He doesn't send an army with the son, which perhaps would have been uh, sensible and wise. He sends his son with the hope that the tenants will respect him because he is his son and pay what's due. There wouldn't have been a Jew in Israel who wouldn't get the point of this parable. It's so simple. Every one of them understood the history of Israel. They knew their Bibles how God, who was the owner and builder of the original vineyard, had sent his prophets to his people, up to including John the Baptist. Well, what happens when the son appears at the vineyard? They kill the landowner's son, stupidly thinking that they can inherit the vineyard for themselves. Don't you just wonder what in the world were they thinking? 
Or as Jesus asks in verse 40, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? How ironic is the answer in verse 41. Back in chapter 7 of Matthew, Jesus says, you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others. It's hard to believe that these learned men would fall into Jesus' trap, but what did they say? He will completely destroy those terrible men and lease his vineyard to other farmers who will give him his fruit at the harvest. With that, they call down their own condemnation. Of course he's going to put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants. What else would he do? Did they really think that by killing the landowner's son that they would inherit the vineyard? Why would they think that was possible? Those first tenants must have been convinced, as I've said, that the owner of the vineyard would never come. They must have been convinced that judgment day for them would never arrive. They were out of relationship, they were independent, and they certainly weren't going to give any of their production away. What other reason can explain their actions? Convinced that the landowner would never return, they boldly killed his beloved son. It sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? And the sad irony of this parable, of course, is that it's told by Jesus just a few days before he, the beloved son, is killed. Look at verse 39. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Just as Jesus would be seized, taken out of Jerusalem and killed a few days later. Clearly this parable is teaching us about God as the landowner and Jesus as his beloved son. And clearly it is teaching us that the chief priests and the Pharisees are like the original tenants of the vineyard. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they knew it was about them. How could they miss it? And yet they still had Jesus put to death. What were they thinking? They must have gotten so used to being tenants being stewards of the vineyard, that they forgot that they didn't own it. They must have been convinced that the true owner would never come to judge them. But if this parable is about the chief priests and the Pharisees, what does it teach us about ourselves? Is it warning warning us not to take any of this for granted? Our world, our life, our salvation... It's all of grace. It's all a gift from God. And we too can be tempted at times to think that we can keep the fruits of God's vineyard for ourselves. We work hard making our living and providing for ourselves and our families and it's easy to forget that everything that we have is not ours but the owner of the vineyard. The owner of this vineyard hasn't returned for 2,000 years. Judgment Day still hasn't arrived. And whether or not we share the fruits of our harvest with those in need, we'll probably not be struck down by lightning. Whether or not we're nice to our neighbours this week, we'll probably not receive a visit from the owner of the vineyard to receive the consequences. But is that all there is? Well, I don't think so. And I want to challenge us more, because that is what Jesus was doing to the chief priests and the Pharisees. If living better lives, which is a good thing, is all that he meant, why did they get so angry at him? We see in verse 45 that they knew he was speaking about them and they wanted to arrest him, to shut him up once and for all. No, there's more to this, isn't there? Unlike last week when we saw the message of the fig tree was that a lack of fruitfulness won't be tolerated and it will be met with swift, harsh judgment. In this vineyard, we see the opposite. This is a good vineyard that has been well made, well put together, well provided for, and it's producing fruit, probably a lot. But Israel and its leadership aren't going to give the owner his share, and they certainly aren't going to give any of its blessings to anyone else around them. Think back to the clearing of the temple a couple of weeks ago. There was nothing wrong with the money changes. They were needed. The money changers were bankers who exchanged Roman currency for shekels so Jewish people could pay their temple tax. You couldn't pay the temple tax with Roman currency. You had to exchange it for shekels. And there was nothing wrong with selling of animals for sacrifice. 
This was prescribed by the Old Testament law because many people travelled too far to bring their sacrificial animals with them. The problem was they were blocking the outsiders. They were blocking the Gentiles from coming into the only place that they were allowed in God's temple. Jesus tells us in verse 43 that the vineyard is the kingdom of God. But God is not as concerned with the physical land and its harvest as he is with the hearts of his people. Isaiah said in verse 7 of our reading, The vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel and the men of Judah the plant he delighted in. He expected justice but saw injustice. He expected righteousness but heard cries of despair. More than just Israel, though, the promised land, the chosen people, God had his eyes on the whole world and all the people in it. Habakkuk 2.14 is really important here. It sums up God's intentions in creating the world and creating human beings on it. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the waters cover the sea. That's what God wanted. He already filled it with his glory. We can see that every day. Beautifully filled it with the physical world and with his glory. But it's not filled with the knowledge of his glory. The knowledge of his glory, that's us. That's our job. People created in his image are to see the glory of God in nature and in creation and not become idolaters, but worship and serve the one who made it. That's what God intended. But the chief priests and the Pharisees are not going to accept Jesus' authority as evidenced by his teaching, his actions, and the prophecies about him in the Old Testament. So in verse 42, he gives them a warning of their imminent judgment that comes from Psalm 118. They are rejecting him as even a stone that would be worth putting into the building. He's been put on the discard pile. But God is going to put him in place as the cornerstone. As they have rejected him, his response is to reject them, to take the kingdom from them and give it to a people who will produce its fruit. God wanted Israel to live for the praise of his glory, to be a beacon for the salvation of the distant nations, the Gentile nations, the outsiders, so that the rich blessings of God on Israel would be a display of God's rich goodness that he wants to give to all nations. That's the harvest. That's the fruit in keeping with righteousness. Justice, mercy, loving kindness. He wanted on display his attributes, the glory of God on full display in Israel for all the world to see so that the Gentiles would praise the true and living God and that the Gentiles, the outsiders, would worship and follow him. That's what God intended. But the chief priests and the Pharisees were not going to let that happen. But are you? Am I? Are we? Are we a light in Narrabri that shines into the darkness and shows Jesus to those who are lost? Or are we like the people in the temple blocking the way? Jesus said he was taking the kingdom away from the first tenants who didn't believe and obey and would give it to a people producing its fruit. That people were the Gentiles, the outsiders, that's us. So let us not be the disobedient, unbelieving tenants who want to keep a tight hold on all the blessings of the kingdom of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all you have done throughout history up until today in saving your people. Heavenly Father, help us to be generous in sharing your kingdom uh, with others, in sharing your kingdom with those who don't know you, that they might see who you are and praise you, give glory to you as you deserve. Help us to be your good tenants. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.